Hey, and welcome to Gleaning the Scriptures. I'm glad that you're here today. We're going to be reading Job chapter 40, but first, I'm going to give you a few questions to ponder so these words aren't just going in one ear and out the other. These questions are meant to help anchor you to the truth of the words being spoken. The first question involves verse 14, which is a gem of a scripture. This is God speaking, and he says, Then I will confess to you that your right arm can save you. Ooh, that your own right hand can save you. Who, who is God's right hand? And why would he be telling Job that his own right hand can save him? I'll give you a hint. This verse comes after a long description. Well, not a description, but a command. A command to Job to keep the wicked under his feet. That's not something that man can do. That's not something that man has the strength to do on his own. So there's two main parts of this scripture. The first part is up to verse 14, and verse 14 is that fulcrum point that shifts from one part to the other. The first part is a description of, um, really it's, it's God speaking, and he's kind of accusing I don't think he's accusing Job. Who does God say is in the wrong here? If he is accusing Job, he's accusing Job or preparing Job to understand that there would have been some future action that he was guilty of. Uh, we know that Job is not guilty in Job 1 1 and Job 1 22. We hear God say that Job is blameless and upright, that in all of this he did not sin or charge God with wrong. Um, so God's quite happy, he's quite pleased with Job's behavior in this circumstance. So if he's not accusing future Job, then who is he accusing? And then following this accusation, we have this command. And then the fulcrum point, and then the next part is all about a monstrous beast. So uh, why would he be all of a sudden talking about a monstrous beast? Well, have you ever heard somebody say... Yeah, you want to watch out for that guy. He's a snake in the grass. That guy is not literally a snake slithering around in the grass. It's a description of somebody's character. Much like Yeshua is not a literal door. He's also not literally a piece of bread that was stuck in the toaster and put butter on for breakfast. It's a description of his character. So... In order to connect these two, I am going to encourage you to take the first step and figure out what the metaphor of the behemoth is talking about. Once you figure that metaphor out, then you can make the connection between the two parts of Job chapter 40. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Hmm? Would you condemn me, that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God, or can you thunder with a voice like His? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, and array yourself with glory and beauty. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud, and humble him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low. Tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together. Bind their faces in hidden darkness. Then I will also confess to you that your right, own right hand can save you. Look now at the behemoth which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips. 
and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus tree in a covert of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes into his mouth. Though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare.